Great. Go okay, ahead. It, it, it is a pleasure to have Michael with us today. Unfortunately, not in person, but uh, remotely. I remind you that Michael is also giving a colloquium tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I hope you will be able to attend. Uh, while Michael received his PhD, I believe from Princeton University, uh, the same year I did, 1989, and has for many positions. I think I met him at Caltech mm. many years ago, um, where he all held a position uh, for many years. And then he moved to Wisconsin, to Madison, right? Where he also a professor there, uh, to finally move to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And, uh, and now he holds also a position at the TLE Institute in Shanghai. I believe he's uh, on leave from, from Amherst. Right? And then, uh, well, Michael, as you probably well know, he's an expert on, on the question of the electric phase transitions in the early universe, baryogenesis. And uh, today uh, he will tell us about uh, this fundamental question that if there is indeed an electric phase transition, but has uh, several physical implications that you will tell us. About. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, thanks, uh, Carlos, uh, very much for the nice introduction. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, please just let me know if the screen looks okay. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't think you're, you're sharing yet. Yeah. Uh, that's, that is probably the reason, yeah. Um, okay, let's go do that. Now should be. Uh, now, are you showing a slide at this point? Oh. I, mm. Are you frozen, Michael, or is me? I, I think it's Michael. A little bit Michael. unstable connection. So, you know what? I'm going to. Uh, yeah, do we want to try without video? And or? turn off the video. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. This is the okay. usual Zoom thing. Okay. Wait. Let's try this okay. again. Share screen. Now, is that visible? No. Uh, no. It, it was visible for uh, before this, but um, now I don't see anything at least. Well, me neither. Then, uh, I actually, appears a message that I'm says really... that you, are, you have started screen sharing. Okay. Um, have you clicked the, the window that you want to share? That... Well, I, I normally know. share yeah, that's good. the whole screen. Okay, well, now, now it just turned now on. That's good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Welcome Thanks, to Oh, oh gosh. Okay. Now, I'm back. Are you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Uh, this is not boding well. How's this? Uh -oh. Let's see. Let's try. Uh, this is a frustrating way to start a seminar for sure. Okay. Let's try this. Um, share. Now. We see that. Good. All right. This is sort of the hit or miss. Okay. Now, hopefully you see my slide. Still, yes, we hear you and we see the slides. Great, so let's keep our fingers crossed and uh, it's possible I'll jump out. Anyway, greetings everyone from Shanghai in the middle of the night. Uh, thanks for being here and thanks again to Carlos for the very nice introduction. And, um, you know, I should just reiterate that there are many experts in the uh, group there on electric phase transition, uh, Carlos, uh, for example, among them. And so uh, over the years, I've had many um, very useful and important conversations with Carlos on, uh, on this subject. So um, I'm glad to be able to talk about this uh, with, with Carlos and others present. So um, the question of uh, was there an electric phase transition, I think is important 
perhaps even more now than it was, um, say, a decade ago because of the discovery of the Higgs boson. And I want to give you a little perspective on this question uh, in this talk. And there are really three uh, big ideas that I'm going to um, concentrate on. The, the first is that uh, nature has actually given us a scale which is not identical to electroweak scale. It's the electroweak temperature. And the scale, um, I'm going to argue, gives us um, a clear beyond the standard model target for colliders in terms of the impact of new physics on the thermal history of electroweak symmetry breaking. Um, the second is a really set of simple arguments that any beyond the standard model physics that changes the thermal history of electroweak symmetry breaking compared to the standard model cannot be too heavy or too feebly coupled to the standard model. And so this is part of why we actually have a very robust target for um, colliders. And the third, which is um, going to be the last part of the talk, is that to really confront theory and experiment, uh, I believe, requires a new era of uh, theoretical computations that involve a combination of effective field theory methods and non-perturbative um, simulations. And so I'm going to highlight some of this point with new results uh, at what I call this theoretical frontier. So uh, let us proceed. And um, so the papers that I'm going to refer to are listed here. I won't go over them now, but I should emphasize, of course, that this work is done in, uh, much of it in collaboration with a talented group of uh, largely junior collaborators. Uh, the first paper is, is single authored by me, and that's the first part of the talk. So here's that. Um, so I'm going to start with the context and questions. And then um, this will be a bit of a general part of the talk. And so for people who are familiar with electroweak phase transition physics, um, this will be certainly some uh, uh, review for you. Uh, and then I'll give you a flavor of these simple arguments as to why the phase transition, if it exists, is a collider target. And then the third part of the talk will be on this question of how to do robust theoretical calculations and then a brief outlook. And, you know, if, if I had an hour and 15 minutes, I would talk a little bit more about specific models and phenomenology, but I don't think I'll have time. So I put that into what I call a coda. And by the way, um, Seth, if there's any issue with the connectivity, please just text me and I'll um, try to fix that. So okay. let's start, start with the context and questions. Um, so I think this question of the electric phase transition is interesting from three standpoints. The first is a pretty general one, which is with the discovery of the Higgs, I think we really face front and center the question of what was the thermal history of electric symmetry breaking? The second is that if there was a, a first order phase transition, then it's possible that the baryon asymmetry was um, generated in conjunction with, ele with electroweak symmetry breaking through electric baryogenesis. Excuse me. And the third um, is a very exciting possibility is in the presence of such a phase transition, there could be the generation of gravitational waves that may be observed in next generation uh, gravitational wave um, searches. In that case, we would like to know whether if you see a signal, uh, first order electroweak phase transition is responsible. So let me start a little bit with this first question just to review in more detail why I think it's interesting. And I want to make an analogy with QCD, uh, where the question of thermal history has been a, an intensive object of study for many years. Uh, and this is just illustrated in this diagram here, which is a, a, a representation of a phase diagram in QCD. Uh, in this diagram on the horizontal axis is the baryon chemical potential and on the vertical axis is the temperature. In the upper part of the diagram would be the deconfined phase of QCD, the so-called quark gluon plasma. In the lower left is the confined, one of the confined phases called the hadron gas where we presumably live. Uh, if you go up to higher and higher baryon chemical potential, uh, people have argued that there are other confined phases that may exist, which I won't talk about now, that are potentially relevant for uh, neutron stars, for example. This line right here is the line such that if one were at sufficiently large baryon chemical potential, then when the universe cools, uh, one goes through a first order phase transition to the confined phase of the hadron gas. And um, it's, it's understood that at some 
uh, non-zero but small value of mu baryon, uh, that line ends, the critical point, and that below that line, the transition is a crossover. And what we now know from combination of, of lattice calculations and the experiments at the Rick Collider are that is that the um, transition indeed in the standard model uh, QCD was a crossover transition. What people are now trying to do at risk beam energy scan is see if they can find evidence for this critical point. Um, so the moral of the story is that uh, there's, there's an enormous amount of activity that continues to be uh, focused on this question of the thermal history as a function of the parameters of, of the theory. And so what we wanna ask is what is the analog in the electroweak sector? The starting point to address that question, um, as I think everyone knows, is the effective potential uh, as a function of the Higgs background field. And what this diagram shows are representative thermal histories uh, according to the behavior of the potential. On the far left is a first order history. Um, so here at high temperature, the symmetric phase is the lowest energy phase uh, as the universe cools. Uh, second minimum develops uh, and at some temperature called the critical temperature, they become, it becomes degenerate in energy with the symmetric phase. And at some temperature below, just below that uh, critical temperature, the universe makes a transition to the broken phase. And the barrier to uh, minima uh, is indicative of a first order transition. Um, as one turns up the mass of the Higgs in the theory, the barrier gets weaker and weaker until at some point it looks like the second diagram, uh, which has no barrier. And so the transition is a, a second order transition. In fact, what we now know for the standard model is that for the, the Higgs mass of the observed Higgs, the transition isn't even a phase transition. It's really a crossover as, as in the QCD case. And we know that from lattice studies, which have I determined the maximum mass uh, for a first order phase transition, the Higgs mass. And what I've listed in this little table or left are different lattice results for this um, endpoint of the first order phase transition, which is somewhere between 70 and 80 GeV. So if you would translate this into a phase diagram for the electric theory, it would look something like what's on the upper right we're now on the horizontal axis, you have the Higgs mass rather than the chemical potential and you still have vertical axis is the temperature in the upper part of the diagram is the electroweak symmetric part of the, uh, the theory and the lower part is the electroweak uh, broken. Uh, the yellow line is the line for a first order uh, electroweak phase transition and it stops at a critical Higgs mass of around 125 GeV so that when we're at 120, uh, around 70 GeV rather, so that when we're at 125 GeV, the transition from symmetric to broken phase is a smooth crossover. So if all we have in life in the universe is the standard model, then all the transitions that we know about um, would be crossover transitions. Of course, for um, many of us, uh, we believe that there is more than just the standard model. And in particular, is there new physics at the electroweak to TeV scale? And so if there is, then we can ask the following question. How does this picture change in the presence of that physics? Um, is, was, was there a phase transition? What is the phase diagram? And if there was a phase transition, was it first order and strongly first order um, for reasons that we'll discuss in a minute? So I think this question of how the pattern of symmetry breaking could change in the presence of an extension of the standard model um, is certainly not a new question, but a very interesting one. And there's a paper by Steve Weinberg that has been very uh, much a catalyst for me in how I think about this. Um, it's his famous paper on um, you know, uh, gauge theories at finite temperature. And in that paper, he did an example of a different theory an ON cross ON theory, where there are two fundamental scalars called phi one and phi two with masses at zero temperature called M chi and M eta. And what he pointed out is that um, depending on the choice of the zero temperature masses, the history of the phase, um, uh, the symmetry breaking could be quite interesting. So for example, if you look at this line labeled one, 
the idea here is that for this choice of the masses at high temperature, you start at the open circle. And as the universe cools, you move along the line until you come from the ON cross ON phase, the most symmetric phase into a phase B, which is a somewhat lower symmetry phase. And that's kind of analogous to the standard model. You know, we think we go from the symmetric phase to a broken phase. But on the other hand, you might have started, let's say line three, where you started actually at high temperature in some lower um, symmetry, symmetry phase. And as the universe cools, a period of time when you go to a higher symmetry phase and then go back to a lower symmetry phase or lines four and five, et cetera. So um, the moral of the story for me is that by even extending the scalar sector in a pretty simple way, the pattern of symmetry breaking in the early universe could be um, quite, more, quite more rich than it is um, in the simple line one case, which we're familiar with for the standard model. So to sort of think about this sort of schematically, here's a, a schematic of what a effective potential might look like uh, in the presence of a beyond the standard model scalar that I called phi, as well as the Higgs. Um, so the, the, the vertical axis coming out of the, you know, the page here in a sense is the, is the energy. So we have this new scalar direction, we have the Higgs direction. Today we live over in the Higgs phase. And the question we wanna ask is how did we end up getting here when at high temperature we started, we think at the, uh, the origin where the potential would have been uh, purely concave and that would have been the minimum of energy. So it's possible, for example, that the transition was still from the origin to the Higgs phase directly, but maybe the nature of that transition is different because the shape of the potential uh, in the presence of this other scalar as well as thermal effects might modify this transition's character from the way it is in the standard model. And that would be of course very interesting. Another possibility is maybe the universe goes to a different phase first. This is sort of in the Weinberg um, paper philosophy. So here's an, another phase where phi has a vacuum expectation value. So the universe goes there for a while and then as the universe continues to cool, uh, it makes a transition to the Higgs phase. And then one can ask, what are the nature of each of these transitions? First order, second order, crossover, et cetera. So the moral of the story is that, you know, there's a really uh, sort of, I think actually a rich landscape of possibilities. And so the questions we can ask if we extend the standard model scalar sector in particular is what is the landscape of potentials and their thermal histories? And then, um, you know, we can, we can invent that theoretically, but we'd like to know how one can probe this physics, particularly the, the non-zero, the finite temperature uh, history experimentally and third, uh, when we actually want to try to confront these ideas with experiment, how reliably can we compute the thermodynamics uh, in the early universe? So um, the second and third motivations for this topic are the baryogenesis motivation and the gravity wave motivation. Uh, let me just remind you uh, what's needed for both of those. What's needed, first of all, is a first order phase transition that proceeds through nucleation of bubbles of broken electroweak symmetry. Um, and how that works in practice is a whole nother talk, which I won't go into, uh, but the key point is bubble nucleation. And then for baryogenesis and for uh, gravity waves to be observable, that transition needs to be strong. And of course, for baryogenesis, we need to have an addition, some CP violation beyond the standard model, which I won't talk about in this talk. So um, with those motivations in mind, uh, what I'm gonna to try to argue is that the modified thermal histories um, in the presence of new physics really give us a clear target for our collider physics at the LHC and beyond. And that target really has two aspects. It has a mass scale reach target and a precision target. So let me just say something in general about experimental probes in case there are any experimentalists listening. Um, you know, how do we probe this potential and its thermodynamics experimentally or how, how does the community? Uh, and there are really, I think, um, three ways to do that, um, two of which are collider physics. Uh, one is to try to produce directly the new scalar and study its properties. Okay, so um, that's sort of pretty clear. 
A second is to note that the presence of this new direction in field space and these new degrees of freedom could lead to very small but perceptible changes in Higgs boson properties that one could probe by making precision measurements of Higgs properties. So Higgs precision tests, for example, in um, next generation Higgs factories uh, would be very interesting. And then finally, you know, sort of a smoking gun of a, of a phase transition, a first order phase transition would be the production of gravity waves in the early universe. So I think there's really a, a very exciting interplay of sort of the different kinds of collider probes uh, that one can undertake and the astrophysical probes. And uh, again, because of the time in this talk, I won't have time to say much about gravitational uh, radiation, but I will concentrate uh, on the other two, the direct production and the Higgs precision tests. And here, uh, the questions I'm gonna introduce in this, or discuss in this talk are how heavy can this new scalar be if it's gonna substantially modify the thermal history of electric symmetry breaking? How is it coupled to the Higgs and how strongly coupled to the Higgs? And can it really be discovered in collider physics? So uh, a key sort of anchor in this discussion is this quantity called the electric temperature that I mentioned earlier. And the way to think about it is to take the Higgs effective potential at finite temperature in what's called the leading order uh, high temperature effective theory, where the form of the potential is very simple. It's given in the, the top red box. There's a quadratic term that depends on quadratically on temperature, T, uh, and then there's the quartic self-interaction plus other terms that are not so relevant for this discussion. And you'll note that in the quadratic term, there's this um, temperature scale called T naught, such that at high temperature, um, the sign of the quadratic term is positive, but when T goes below T naught, the sign changes, and this catalyzes the onset of electroweak symmetry break. So T naught is really decisive and T naught can be um, calculated in perturbation theory in the standard model. And I've given you the formula for T naught squared in the middle red box. Um, and you'll see that it depends um, in terms of the dimension full parameter on the Higgs vacuum expectation value V on the far right. But it also depends on many of the other couplings in the theory, the Higgs self coupling lambda, the electroweak gauge couplings G and G prime, and the, um, and importantly, on the top quark Yukawa coupling. So this means that T naught and V are not identical. And depending on what nature would have chosen for lambda, G, G prime, Y, T, et cetera, um, T naught could be really close to the uh, Higgs um, VEV, or it could be substantially different. For the values of these couplings that we now um, know, uh, T naught is around 140 GeV. Uh, and so um, that's the number that sort of sets the scale for thermal history of electric symmetry breaking. And so that's what I call T electroweak. So with that in mind, uh, we wanna ask what, um, how would one generate a barrier that might lead to a first order phase transition um, at around the temperature T electroweak? And I'm gonna illustrate that with a really simple scenario called Higgs portal scenario, uh, where I introduce one new scalar phi that could be either charged under electroweak uh, gauge symmetries or an electroweak singlet. Um, but what I wanna do is sort of generically um, sort of delineate the possible histories that would have a, a first order phase transition to electroweak broken uh, phase that we live in today. So here is, is a way to classify those histories. Um, so what's shown are the two axes, the in field space, Higgs and the phi axis. Um, and there are three different sort of patterns that um, I've shown. On the far left is a so-called one-step transition from the origin to the Higgs phase at the temperature T electroweak. And down below that um, picture is that you introduce intention gauge variant operator, h squared phi squared, loop of x, this could cause the Higgs phase to be first order. Um, it's a finite temperature loop effect. And just to introduce notation, there's a coefficient called A2 um, in this um, setup here. That's the operator coefficient. A second possibility um, that I alluded to earlier 
is in the middle panel, um, and that's the two-step history, where first the universe goes from the completely symmetric phase to the phi phase at a temperature I call T phi. Then at a lower temperature, at T electroweak, it goes to the Higgs phase. And here, the same operator can lead to a first order phase transition. But now, uh, this turns out to be a tree level effect uh, rather than a loop effect. And a third possibility is over on the right, where um, there's a one step transition to um, a phase of mixed um, VEVs. Phi and H both have VEVs, it's still electroweak broken. Uh, and here, the interesting operator that you can write down in the, in the scalar potential is um, h squared phi. Um, it's a cubic operator, and I'll call that coefficient a1. And in this case, the um, barrier is induced by this operator at tree level, and so it's really a tree level effect um, that, that becomes apparent as the universe uh, cools. And of course, you could have some combination of of the second and the third panels, but to really classify things in a, in a simple way, I'm gonna use um, these three. So in this uh, first uh, paper that I mentioned, you know, I put down some simple arguments that for the first two possibilities, uh, the presence of this scale T electra weak uh, and the possibility of a first order phase transition puts a, a rough upper bound on how heavy the phi mass can be. Um, and that mass turns out to be somewhere around 700 GeV, which means it's really quite accessible uh, for collider physics. Let me illustrate one of the arguments. I'm not gonna go through all of them here. Um, you can read them in the paper, but just to give you a flavor for the logic, I'm gonna pick this um, second possibility of a two-step transition to illustrate why one gets a, a mass bound. So here's the transition history. Um, and so again, the point is that we have a tree level barrier uh, with H squared phi squared operator and the barrier here is causing a first order phase transition in the second step. Now, what we want for this particular scenario to, to happen is the temperature T1, or what I called before T5, to be greater than the temperature T2, which is the temperature of going to the uh, Higgs phase. And that temperature T2 is around the electroweak temperature. So um, to analyze whether or not that's possible, one has to actually look at the effective potential for phi along the phi direction, where H has, no va has zero value, zero background field. And the form of the potential is, is pretty simple. It's given in the red box. This is again in the high T effective theory. Um, you'll see that there's a quantity B2, which is a zero temperature quartic interaction that's negative. Um, not quartic, I'm sorry, quadratic interaction that's negative, uh, like in the standard model. And then there's a thermal correction that involves the A2 operator, our, our cross quartic interaction, and B4, which is the quartic interaction that you can write down. And then of course there is the quartic interaction itself. So it's a pretty simple potential. So what we want is for the sign of the quadratic term to turn negative at a temperature T1 that is higher than the T electric temperature so that the universe first goes to the phi phase before it goes to the Higgs phase. And so with that requirement, um, one can then translate it with these same parameters into a statement about the mass of the phi particle at zero temperature. And that requirement then is given in this red box here. Mass of phi at t equals zero depends on the same parameters, A2 and B4. It depends on the Higgs VEV and it depends on the electric temperature. And so you can calculate a number. So um, since we're doing perturbation theory here, we wanna make sure that the couplings A2 and B4 are in the perturbative domain. And so if we pick the, the values of those couplings sort of at the upper end of uh, what would be a perturbative range, you get that the mass of the phi is around, maximally around 350 GeV. So um, that, as I said, is, is pretty accessible to, for collider physics. Now this is done in perturbation theory. There are other effects that I'm not talking about here. 
uh, with non-perturbative calculations, uh, we think that this mass can go a little bit higher. So I put a kind of a very conservative factor of two uh, on this to get a 700, G, 700 GeV upper bound on the mass. Okay. So for the first panel, there's an analogous uh, logic. And for people who are familiar with the light stop scenario in, in supersymmetry, it's, it's essentially that logic. Uh, and it again leads to a very um, pretty, pretty rigorous upper bound, which I'll throw a, an uncertainty factor in of a factor of two, but it's still below uh, one TeV. And so what one concludes for either of these thermal histories is that uh, the mass reach uh, is well, the mass bound is well within the reach of the LHC or possible future colliders, as I'll discuss in a moment. So, um, as I said, there's this sort of factor of two uncertainty um, that we could discuss later on. Um, now, what do we know from um, the LHC is that uh, particles, new scalars that carry uh, QCD charge are constrained to be heavier now than 700 GeV. So, it's likely that if phi is doing the job with either of these thermal histories, it is um, uh, uh, a, a QCD singlet. Uh, and so that means the cross sections are going to be electroweak cross sections or uh, cross sections associated with the Higgs portal interaction, uh, which we'll see in, in the following tables are within reach of either the LHC or uh, possible future colliders. Um, and then I'll come back to the discussion of precision Higgs studies in, in just a minute. So let's so do Michael, an Michael. Yes. So, uh, just a just a question. So if, so if I could be completely uncharged in in the setting, it could be as a pure singlet, or it could carry electroweak quantum numbers. Um, and so I'm being a little agnostic about either possibility right now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So in fact, um, I want to do an example where phi is not a complete singlet. Um, I'll come to the singlet case maybe a little later on. Uh, where it is, it is a QCD singlet, but it's charged under electroweak. So it could be produced in, um, for example, Drell-Yan production in E plus E minus. And just to illustrate the kinds of um, cross sections one would expect for different masses, this, you can look at this table here. The first column gives different center mass energies uh, for prospective um, future E plus E minus colliders. Uh, the second column is the mass of the phi scalar. Uh, so if we take the first row, just an example, 340 GeV is uh, one of the design energies for the FCCEE or the CEPC in China. And so there, um, if, if phi is relatively light, uh, then um, say 100 GeV, then the cross section is pretty big. And so with uh, say five inverse out of barns of integrated luminosity, uh, you would get lots of events, you know, or almost a million events. So that's certainly doable. But then of course, if phi is heavier, um, say up to 700 GeV, sort of my rough mass upper bound, then of course you can't do that with lower center mass energy. You would need to go to something like click, which is given in the last um, row here. And there again, say with click design energy, you would still get lots of events. Uh, that means it's probably um, discoverable. But again, it really depends on the mass, whether or not a given collider, E plus E minus collider is going to be able to see it. On the other hand, um, in PP, uh, you know, because it's a, a partons a center mass energies are quite variable, um, you know, the LHC could see um, something up to about uh, 700 uh, GeV rather, um, rather well, I think, you know, maybe a couple thousand events. Uh, but you know, if one goes to say a hundred TeV PP collider, which people are talking about, then again, um, at the upper end of the mass range, 700 GeV, uh, one could anticipate with 30 inverse atom arms of, of integrated luminosity, maybe about a million events. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so depending on the mass and the center mass energy of the collider, um, it does seem to me like um, Drell-Yan production of an electroweak multiplet that would give one of these uh, phase transition histories uh, would be certainly uh, accessible. Now I want to turn uh, to the. Oh yes, Michael, uh, I have. How do you imagine? So this uh, Higgs is uh, coupled to fermions in a way proportional to, uh, so to the standard model coupling. So we are mixing with the 
with the Higgs or, or how do they? Uh... I, I've been a little agnostic about the, the uh, Yukawa sector. Um, I see, so, 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 so imagine that we saw many ones, we will be seeing no, no matter what, yeah. Yeah, I've just said, you know, is the production cross section, at least in the, the range that you could anticipate seeing it at a, at a collider, but the details of how you, what the signatures are, I did not go into in this paper. Um, okay, very good. You know. Great, thanks, both great question, thank you. So uh, let me now turn to Higgs boson properties for a few minutes, and then the last part of the talk will be about uh, the theory. Um, and so there are lots of possible precision Higgs um, signatures of a first order electric phase transition. Uh, I've listed a set of them here. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of them. Um, sadly, um, Higgs diphoton decay and exotic decays are very interesting. I have some backup slides about them. Uh, but what I'm gonna focus on instead are the middle two, signal strengths and um, in principle self-coupling. And here, uh, as, as compared to the first earlier discussion, this operator h squared phi that would lead to a barrier um, is particularly interesting for these, um, these Higgs properties. So the presence of this, bear, this h squared phi operator generically leads to mixing between the neutral component of the phi multiplet if it's an electric multiplet or just phi itself it's a, if it's a singlet and the Higgs. And so this H5 mixing is what really leads to modifications of signal strength and self-coupling. And it also has the added possibility that you can produce phi singly in the same way that you would produce the standard model Higgs, uh, but because they mix. Okay, so these are they're very interesting um, consequences here. So the question is, you know, how big does this barrier have to be? And what are the consequences for the precision studies? Is what I want to focus on here. And so here, um, we can't be quite as generic as we could be for the mass range. Um, and so we need to invoke additional criteria. Um, and the criteria you can imagine invoking are, um, if there's a first order transition, is it um, strong enough to enable electric baryogenesis? Which, which really means if a baryon asymmetry is made during the process, is that asymmetry um, frozen in, in the electric phase is, is the, process of washing out baryon numbers um, uh, uh, suppressed. Uh, another possibility is that are the gravity waves observable? I'm gonna focus on the first bullet here. And without going through all the arguments, uh, one can show that um, successful baryogenesis uh, would require that the ratio of the operator coefficient to the product of the Higgs self-coupling in the electric temperature has to be bigger than about one. Uh, so again, we see here the presence of this electroweak temperature um, as, a, as a key ingredient uh, in determining the collider properties. And it's relatively straightforward to turn this criteria in the red box into statements about things that you can measure. For example, the mixing angle, then generically, uh, its sign should be bigger in magnitude than about 0.01. And any changes in the Higgs self-coupling relative to the Higgs self-coupling in the standard model should be bigger than a few um, parts per million, uh, parts per thousand, I'm sorry. Um, and so in principle, again, that makes these uh, precision um, studies a good way to look for uh, indications of a first order phase transition. Um, and it also, by the way, as I said, the mixing allows uh, for one to produce the phi singly. Uh, and again, I've, I've just asked the question in this slide, you know, how big are the cross sections if you're at the minimum mixing angle of about 0.01, how big are the cross sections to produce the phi particle in different processes? The upper part of this slide has a table for so-called associated production or Z phi production in E plus E minus. And without going through all the numbers in the table, uh, if you just look at the last column, that's the number of events you would expect uh, in, um, at the design luminosities for various collider options you will see that uh, it's not very promising if nature put things at the very small mixing angle. The mixing angle could be larger, in which case you would have more um, you know, probability of seeing it in E plus E minus, but if you're at this sort of uh, 
um, lower bound, then um, E plus E minus may not be the best way to look for it. On the other hand, single phi production in PP via gluon fusion uh, looks quite promising. And that's the bottom table. And in particular, I just want to highlight 100 TeV PP collider, uh, where at the upper end of the mass range, 700 GeV, you could still anticipate producing uh, several hundred thousand events uh, at the design luminosity of, uh, of uh, 100 TeV PP collider. So um, if I had more time, I'd show you some model um, concrete realizations of, this, of these numbers, uh, but these are sort of generic sort of um, orders of magnitude that you would expect um, based on this argument about the, uh, the mixing uh, and the mass scale. So it says that PP is really, it seems to me, uh, for direct production, the way to go, but uh, other Higgs property studies, um, you know, in E plus E minus are very interesting for probing the effects of the mixing angle. So now in the last part of the talk, I wanna shift gears a little bit, hopefully convince you that we have a really um, clear target for our collider physics program. And I wanna talk now about how much should you believe everything I just said? Um, in other words, how theoretically robust are the calculations of the thermodynamics and then the connection to uh, phenomenology? Here I'm gonna talk about some results from these, uh, these three papers. So um, I gave generic arguments um, about modified thermal history um, but there have been lots and lots of model realizations. Um, Carlos, Lin Tao, uh, Marcella, and uh, Econ and others there in Chicago have, have worked on many of them um, and I don't have time to talk about them. Um, so the generic arguments, I think, sort of encapsulate what we've learned uh, in these um, large number of model studies. But the real question is, how reliable um, are the um, you know, the analyses of the finite temperature physics in these model studies and the connection with phenomenology, therefore, how robust is that? And let me explain what the problem is. So the problem is the following. At finite temperature, when we calculate um, the effective potential and the thermodynamics, there are loops, and the loops involve thermal distribution functions. And the low momentum part of the loops uh, essentially are governed by this parameter I call G effective. G effective goes like a ratio of the gauge coupling in the, in the loop, G squared, uh, times the temperature, divided by a geometric factor pi and the thermal mass of the particles in the loop. In, in this case, I'm taking a scalar field phi. And the problem is the following, is that this quantity um, can be rather large if one is in the vicinity of a phase transition. Um, I say it's, it's an infrared sensitive quantity, meaning the loop, the low momentum part of the loop is, is governed by this parameter. And so if the denominator is the thermal mass of the phi particle, and if the quadratic term in the potential is getting very small because you're near a phase transition, then this parameter G effective is not small. Uh, this is an example of of what's called the Linda problem in finite temperature field theory. And so perturbation theory is not really reliable um, in general in this, uh, in this domain. And in fact, in the standard model, um, you know, lattice studies, if one sort of translates them back into an effective coupling, tells us that the G is, is order one in the vicinity of the electroweak phase transition in the standard model near the critical mass, Higgs mass of 70 GeV. So one really shouldn't um, fall on one's sword for perturbation theory in making strong statements about um, the phase transition behavior, particularly uh, when you're near maybe the region that a phase transition uh, is weakly uh, first order. So, I put this now into this sort of problem of, of theory meets phenomenology. Um, and the elements of this problem are the following. So the most reliable way to analyze phase transition properties, um, you know, in thermal histories is non-perturbative calculations, lattice calculations. Uh, on the other hand, if we wanna look at a variety of different models and parameter space and make connections to experiment, uh, that's not very practical um, because there's a lot of 
computational investment that has to be made and uh, analysis machinery that has to be uh, applied. On the other hand, to do phenomenology and model building, um, perturbation theory is the way to go. Um, but on the other hand, we, as for the reasons I just indicated, um, you know, the quantitative reliability for thermal histories and phase transition is um, questionable. And so that needs to, at a minimum, be verified somehow by non perturbative calculations. So the way forward um, is a program of what I call benchmarking perturbation theory with non perturbative calculations. And I'm going to spend a little time now telling you about how we've been trying to do that uh, and some of the latest results. So the strategy is the following. Um, the starting point is to take the full theory and employ what's called a dimensionally reduced three-dimensional effective field theory, where what one does is take what are called the heavy Matsubara modes of the theory at finite temperature and integrate them out, uh, and then uh, proceed in a couple different directions. Uh, with the remaining degrees of freedom, if the new scalars, the so-called zero Matsubara mode of the new scalars are still pretty heavy, you can integrate those out of the effective theory as well. And it turns out uh, one ends up with a standard model-like effective theory where lattice calculations have already been done. So one can actually, what we say is repurpose those existing lattice calculations and infer back about the parameters of the full theory um, to see for what choices would one have had uh, unmodified thermal history. Another direction is if the new BSM scalars are actually light themselves to keep them in the full theory, uh, the effective field theory and perform new lattice simulations. And I'll end with some results of that um, uh, shortly. And once one has done that, then we wanna compare um, the results of these non-perturbative uh, EFT uh, combinations uh, with the uh, fully perturbative calculations and see if we get some insight into how well our perturbation theory uh, uh, analyses are working. So let me say a little more about this EFT uh, dimensional reduction. Um, and so there's a kind of a nice picture here from one of our papers that I think illustrates the idea. The idea, um, so there's uh, the vertical axis here are scales at finite temperature. Um, there's what's called the super heavy scale which are the mass scales associated with the, what are called the non-zero Matsubara modes of, the, um, of all the particles in the theory. It's pi times temperature. In the middle is what we call a heavy scale, which is the Debye mass scale, or the, the sort of standard thermal mass of the time component of the gauge fields and of the, um, uh, you know, of, uh, of the scalar fields. And then there's the light um, scale, which is um, if one has a phase transition and the mass of the scalar particle zero Matsubara mode is getting very small, uh, its mass then is typically of order G squared T. That's why we have the Linda problem. And so um, there are these three scales that one really um, sees as distinct and one can then proceed to do an EFT uh, organization of the problem according to what degrees of freedom you're keeping at what scale. So the idea is with these arrows on the right, we start with a full theory, we integrate, integrate out the non-zero Matsubara modes, we end up with uh, a three-dimensional effective field theory, uh, then we can further go down in scale and integrate out the time component of the gauge field, and we end up with what we call L3 bar, which keeps degrees of freedom that have masses of order G squared T and below. And here, then the potential is really simple. Uh, the scalar potential, it's shown in the bottom. There's just, um, phi is now the Higgs, it's not the, not the new scalar. I, sh I should have used different notation, I guess. Um, there is a quadratic term uh, in three dimensions, uh, mu squared, and a uh, quartic um, self-interaction -inter with now a new coupling called lambda three bar. And for this theory, there were actually uh, many lattice calculations done a um, couple decades ago. So the idea for us is to sort of repurpose those lattice calculations and then work backwards up this chain uh, to infer something about the full theory that includes the new uh, BSM scalars. So there's really three steps here then to summarize. So shown over on the right, 
the first, um, in this first part of this um, approach is to assume the BSM fields are either heavy or super heavy. So we integrate them completely out um, in these first two steps. Then we're left with this effective standard model-like theory where the parameters mu bar and lambda three bar are now functions of the BSM parameters. And then we use the existing lattice calculations that tell us where in the space of mu bar and lambda three bar one would have a first order phase transition and translate that back into the parameters of the full theory. So I'm gonna illustrate that um, with uh, simple Higgs portal models. And um, there are two that we've been working on, a real gauge singlet and the electroweak triplet, which are, are very simple extensions of the standard model scalar sector. I just gonna make the quick comment that I don't believe either of these are realized in nature in and of themselves. Um, I think of them more as kind of the spherical cow of this problem that allow us to see the key features of what would appear in more UV complete theories. Um, that, uh, uh, but to do it in this sort of simple way, we can sort of see the, the, main, uh, the main, main features that are relevant for phase transitions. So I'm gonna illustrate now in the last maybe 10 minutes or so uh, with the electroweak triplet, um, first with this idea of repurposing um, um, the lattice calculations that exist. So why is the triplet interesting by the way? So the triplet is interesting uh, because it allows um, uh, all these different types of uh, interactions that we've talked about to um, occur and cause a, a very rich history of phase transitions. Uh, there are thermal loop effects and there's also a tree level barrier effect when you extend the standard model with the real triplet. Um, and that's going to be illustrated over on the far right, upper right. Now we have the potential as a function of the Higgs and of the real triplet and the neutral component. Um, the transition to the Higgs phase, as I said earlier in the talk, could occur either in one step um, or it could occur in two steps. Um, and in this case, even in step one, it's interesting because since phi, then sigma carries electric quantum numbers, it is actually, this first step would be a, a electric symmetry breaking step but we would have the universe in a different electroweak vacuum for a while before making the second step to the existing electroweak vacuum in the Higgs phase. And so it's, it's sort of these possibilities or this picture here that I showed earlier in the talk. Uh, because of time, I don't think I'll belabor this next point, which is um, you know, this two-step transition is kind of interesting because it allows for a novel baryogenesis mechanism, but I think I'll just skip over that because I really want to talk about the, the um, the non-perturbative analysis. So we're gonna focus first on this one-step history, um, the green, uh, where we use this repurposing idea of existing lattice calculations and effective field theory to draw some conclusions about the phase diagram of the theory. So here's the phase diagram. On the horizontal axis is the mass of the triplet scalar, and on the vertical axis is the Higgs portal coupling. Uh, the gray region we'll come back to a little later on when we do, uh, when I show you some results of dynamical calculations. The light blue uh, is, the, is the region that we conclude would lead to a crossover transition going to the uh, Higgs phase, whereas the green corresponds to a first order uh, phase transition. And so um, one point I wanna emphasize here is that this boundary between the blue and the green is not something we could ever infer using perturbation theory. And so this is already, <coughs> excuse me, uh, an important indicator of why having a non-perturbative um, calculation is important if we really want to know what the, the landscape of thermal histories is. So now um, I want to illustrate an interplay with phenomenology before I go to the, um, the next, uh, next little discussion. These dotted lines are lines that correspond to relative changes in the rate for the Higgs to decay to two photons. And the reason why this can happen is shown in the diagram on the upper left. The charge components of the triplet multiplet that interact with the Higgs with the same Higgs portal coupling have, have, will give loop effects that modify the Higgs diphoton decay rate. And it turns out uh, for a first order phase transition that 
is always leading to a reduction in the Higgs diphoton decay rate. And so delta is the relative decrease in the Higgs diphoton decay rate compared to the standard model. And different choices of delta correspond to different lines in this plane because the loops affect on the Higgs portal coupling and on the mass of phi. So if in a Higgs factory one measures a, a decrease of the Higgs diphoton decay rate compared to the standard model expectation, it would tell you you're on one of these lines, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So that's some information about the phase diagram from experiment. But you'd like to know more. For example, what is the mass of phi and uh, of, of the triplet sigma rather? So one way to look for that is to do a search for what are called disappearing charge tracks. Um, and there's a reason why we can uh, use that, which again I can talk about in question period. But it might tell you what the mass of sigma is. Um, and so you might, for example, learn that the mass of the sigma is around, say, 280 GeV. Uh, and then the Higgs diphoton decay rate measurement might tell you which one of these dotted curves you are on. And then you might learn whether or not, in this theory, you live in the blue region, the crossover region, or in the green region, the first order phase transition region. So I think it's a really exciting interplay, <clears throat> illustration of the interplay of experiment with direct production, Higgs factory, and non-perturbative calculations uh, to learn something in, in real concrete way about what the phase diagram of the theory is. Uh, Michael, um, yeah. since you talk about disappearance tracks, what is the mass difference between the charge and the neutral component of these uh, triplets? It's of order 160 MeV. Uh-huh, okay. <clears throat> And, and that's a, um, it gets a little, it, it can be a little bigger at two loop, but it's still um, within the, the disappearing charge track um, um, sort of parameter space region. Um, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna skip this slide, which has to do with higher dimension operators, because I wanna talk now about, in the last five minutes, about the new non perturbative results that are relevant for this two step region. And these are results that we've obtained with lattice calculations that now include the triplet as a dynamical degree of freedom in the low energy um, effective field theory. So here's the phase diagram. It's a little bit like what you saw before, but the colors are different. Um, the light pink region is the region that was the crossover region in blue before, that's the same. The red region, region four, is the region for a one-step first order phase transition from the symmetric phase to the Higgs phase. The dark blue region at the upper left is a region where the electroweak minimum in the theory is, is metastable, so we don't analyze that. And then the little slice of orange, gray, and light blue is the region for this two-step history. Now, what are the different colors? The different colors are the following. In the orange, the first transition to the sigma phase is crossover, which we learned from lattice. And in the light blue, uh, and the second uh, transition to the Higgs phase is um, first order. In the light blue, both transitions are first order. And the gray indicates a little bit of ambiguity from the lattice calculations about where the boundary between these two is, just because we couldn't do a lot of, of um, parameter space points. The um, crosses correspond to different benchmark parameter choices that we took from the lattice um, to, to test this uh, or to anchor this, uh, anchor this plot. So you can see it's very interesting what we learned from the lattice. Not only is there a two-step history possible in a small region of parameter space, but the, depending on where one is, the nature of the transitions can be either both first order or one crossover and one first order. And the phenomenology, again, would be the same as before. Now, how do we know whether or not it's crossover or first order, uh, or second order, rather? Um, there is a quantity that one can measure on the lattice called the susceptibility. Um, look in the red box on the bottom. Uh, it's basically a comparison of, of volume averages of the condensate of the triplet uh, field um, squared. And 
Um, the plot of that quantity is on the upper part of the diagram. Temperature is on the horizontal axis. The susceptibility is on the vertical axis. Uh, these points correspond to different lattices um, that are used to calculate the susceptibility. And if it was a phase transition, say a second order phase transition, you would see a real discontinuity right around the critical temperature. But um, if you blow this up and you look at these points right around here, it's a smooth uh, behavior. So there's no um, phase transition that's occurring. It's all smooth. Um, so we conclude that even when it uh, isn't a first order phase transition, it's, it's, a, it's a crossover, not a second order transition because there's no discontinuity and susceptibility. Now, the last thing I just wanna emphasize is the comparison with perturbation theory. And this is, this is I think, really important for the, for the community. So what's plotted here are the condensates of the Higgs, phi dagger phi over temperature in the red, and the triplet sigma sigma over temperature uh, as a function of temperature on each plot. The, uh, let's look over on the right. The dotted points correspond to the lattice simulations. And the blue, again, are the triplet. The red are the, lat are the doublet. If you look over on the far right, um, both of them have zero values at high temperature. And then as one cools down, uh, there's a jump uh, in the value of the triplet condensate at about 123 GeV. That's indicative of a first order phase transition. Uh, the Higgs is still staying um, uh, small. And then as you cool down further, the triplet drops down to essentially zero and the lattice and the doublet jumps up to a um, uh, finite value. That's a first order phase transition to the doublet phase from the lattice. The corresponding curves are calculations of the same quantity at two loop order in perturbation theory in the effective field theory. Um, so you can see the blue is what you would expect in perturbation theory for the, for the triplet behavior. You can see that the critical temperature is off by somewhere around 10% or more, which is actually quite important for gravity waves. And the, the same is true for the, um, the jump in the, in the red, which is the, the doublet phase, the Higgs phase. Over on the left um, is the same at a different choice of parameters where there's no discontinuity in the lattice calculation of the, of the triplet condensate. So that's a smooth crossover transition here. But if you note, the perturbative calculation still indicates a discontinuity. So it, it would lead us to believe there's a first order phase transition when in fact the lattice is telling us that it's a smooth um, transition. So this is a caution about concluding things too strongly from perturbation theory when we're near the region where there might be a crossover transition in reality. Um, and so this is just indicative of why it's important to benchmark these perturbative calculations uh, with lattice studies. So I'm a little over on time, so let me quickly go to my um, outlook. So the big takeaway message is that, you know, the thermal history of electric symmetry breaking is a really important problem for the field. And we have some hope of actually um, really probing it experimentally um, uh, because the temperature scale is, is rather low. And so any new scalar that couples um, to the Higgs can't be too heavy or too feebly coupled to modify the standard model thermal history. And that gives us this collider target. Um, to really uh, pursue this sort of theory experiment interface is gonna take more work like I just illustrated for you of this uh, use of effective field theory and non-perturbative methods to benchmark our perturbative calculations that we use for phenomenology. And I think there's a really rich and exciting area for um, early career uh, theorists in particular, as well as experimentalists who wanna, wanna design um, probes um, to get involved. So I will stop there and thanks very much. Okay, so you can unmute to, to thank Michael. Then thank you very much for. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for this uh, very clear uh, seminar and instructive one. So, are there questions? <laughs>
I have a, a more generic question, uh, Michael. So sorry, I may even appear. Uh, I think I have a background. Um, so, so this is very interesting thinking about the difference between obviously uh, perturbative calculations and, and lattice. And, and uh, as you said, we we have seen in this here and there when we even when we think about the standard model results. Um, one thing I have been thinking that I'm not sure how to address necessarily I'm thinking about it is in all these calculations, although we have these crossovers and, and these, um, 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 these continuity showing first order phase transition and so, intrinsically, we are thinking that um, we, there is a, a, an instant of, uh, um, uh, of a jump in, in the thermal evolution but altogether, we compute everything in the background of um, uh, a thermal history, correct? So we are thinking that everything is, um, that temperature and time are, are intimately connected. Have you thought about that? Yeah, so a little bit. Um, I don't have a lot concrete to say, but you're saying if, uh, you know, we make assumptions about thermal equilibrium and making yeah. that relationship between temperature and time. And so now if, if we're out of equilibrium because a phase transition is going on, uh, how robust is that uh, connection? Yeah, I, I guess, and I'm just thinking out loud. So, you know, and it's also still early in the morning in Shanghai. So if I say something totally ridiculous, that's probably why. No. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I think that the, the, the time scale for the transition, you know, compared to the Hubble time uh, is, mm -hmm. is still pretty short. Um, you know, there's work by, by Guy Moore who looked at this in, um, in the lattice. And, and concluded that instead of it being one Hubble time, you know, the, for, a, for a bubble to fill the volume of Hubble space, it's actually to get to where the, the scalar is at, at its broken phase value is about 10 to the minus three of the Hubble time. Mm -hmm. So the actual thermodynamically relevant time scale is very short compared to the Hubble time. Whereas bubble dynamics for things like tunneling and, and other for baryogenesis, um, could could be longer, um, so that's that. Those are my initial thoughts about that problem. That probably, for the dynamics, we can make this assumption of uh, of uh, in time local thermal equilibrium even during the phase transition. Um, but if we were really to try to go in in more sort of um, fine grained way to the thermodynamics on timescales of order ten to the minus three the Hubble time, uh, there might be some ambiguities there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's, I think it's a really interesting question. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, can I ask one, one uh, simple question? Sure. So, so you, you show this plot to indicate possible um, issues or precautions that we need to keep uh, when we use perturbative calculation versus lattice, yes. So yes, the, we, we understand there is this uh, uh, quantitative uh, um, unpreciseness in, in terms of determining uh, transition time. But on top, I mean, to me, this qualitative issue, meaning when it is actually crossover, we, we think it is the first order. This seems to be somewhat more severe in, in, in that sense. So the, my question is that, is it ever possible uh, uh, that the perturbative calculation can ever tell us about it is actually either second order or crossover, or it is just that the perturbative calculation will always tell us first order because theoretical, uh, we don't have enough theoretical control to even uh, ever talk about second order crossover uh, tradition at all. So, so I, it's a great question and I, I'm glad you asked it. it. To me, this is the fundamental issue is that you know, if you look at the plot on the right, um, there it's a quantitative question because in some sense, the, the degree of the jump is large enough that the transition is quote unquote strong. And so you can sort of believe perturbation theory is telling you there's a first order transition, but it doesn't get the temperature quite right. Mm -hmm. But as the, as the parameters are chosen to get closer and closer to the end point of a first order phase transition, the perturbation theory just breaks down. Right. Uh, this is this is really the Linda problem, and and there's no good way around it in perturbation theory, and so 
So I think we, we just have to, you know, if we think there's a model that's really important uh, that, that, that may be realized in nature, and we really wanna know, you know, has experiment killed the possibility of a phase transition, a first order phase transition or not, we're gonna ultimately have to use a non-perturbative calculation to, to answer that question. Um, I see. Thanks. You know, that, that, I, that to me is one of the big learnings for me in this whole business is that I don't see right now with perturbation theory a good way to, uh, um, to, to get, you know, any insight into the scenario that you would have on the left in this plot. All right, I see. Okay, thanks. So Michael, um, are, are there ways to, do, do we understand like specific non-perturbative effects that we could try to take into account or try to understand analytically, like, you know, as if a, a, a one instanton sector or something, or are we just so in the dark that, that lattice studies is the only way? Well, um, so there, I think there's two aspects to your question. Um, first of all, um, are there non-perturbative effects that you might think about in perturbation theory, like, like instantons? In the triplet case, it's the first transition, uh, the transition from the first to the second phase may be affected by monopoles. The first phase, mm. uh, there are monopole solutions. And so the lattice, of course, will see those effects and we don't have those in perturbation theory. So if you made some model of monopole gas or something, maybe you could mock that up. I, I don't know. That's an interesting uh, question. Um, and, and the second is, is the Linda problem. <laughs> you right. know, is you just can't, you have to resum. And I don't know how to resum uh, in any good way. And it's really just intrinsic. You know, this is unlike uh, when we do the daisy resummation uh, which is this is really encoded in 3D EFT. That's a well-defined resummation that you can do. I don't know of a good resummation that cures the Linda problem because this expansion parameter, g squared t over pi times the thermal mass, is just big. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's yeah. interesting. But 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 the other non-perturbative effects again. That's probably case by case on the you know the topological properties of each phase in a given scenario. And so we encountered this in the, the triplet case. The triplet is so interesting that way because it has this monopole solution. And we're already seeing, you know, when there's a tree level barrier, you would expect perturbation theory to get pretty close in terms of the temperature. That's over on the right. But there's already sort of order 10% problem here. And, um, and then there's even in the the smaller barrier limit, there's a crossover transition. So what's going on there? That's telling us that even when there's a tree level barrier, which you think might be the most theoretic, uh, most amenable to perturbation theory, you're still in a bit of trouble. Um, so, so I think it really is an open problem how, if there's a way to get um, um, some more insight from perturbation theory. So far, I don't see a lot of ways to do that. <laughs> Michael, uh, you mentioned that the precise determination of the temperature was important for gravitational wave phenomenon. Could you comment right. on that? Yeah. If I remember correctly, the latent heat parameter goes like temperature to the fourth. And so if you have a 10% uncertainty in your temperature, then that's your order 40% in this, this, uh, this parameter that goes into the, you know, the strength of the signal. And so, um, 10% may not be as decisive for baryogenesis, but, but for something where there's a high power of the temperature involved, um, that's, that's where I think one has to worry in particular. Very good. Oh, can, I, can I ask a, a follow-up question regarding this uh, perturbation theory calculation? If, if uh, time is okay, if not, sure. I can um, have, so, you seem to distinguish, so, um, I mean, for example, Weinberg's paper motivate why per, uh, perturbation theories breaks down. I mean, that's his starting point in a sense. And then he tried to teach us like how you overcome that problem by doing careful uh, daisy resumes, for example. And they, they improve perturbation expansion. So in that sense, uh, by doing resumations, either like what, like just a simple daisy resumation or like super daisy resumation as done by Sony group peoples at some point, you can get it closer, closer to the phase transition point by doing keep doing uh, these calculations. Mm -hmm. 
But then uh, Linde privatization of the problem is just said that there is no simple way to you can ever get to this uh, transition point because uh, no matter what you do, you just uh, you just need to face this disaster. But then you seem to say you seem to somewhat distinguish this uh, dangerous uh, the problem that solved can be solved by dangerous information versus Linde problem. Or am I just to get cut them? Yes, yes, they they are distinct. Okay. Um, the, the daisy resummation has to do with the quadratic divergences uh, and loops that turn into um, uh, you know, these, uh, these important temperature corrections to give the thermal mass. And so um, you know, if you look at, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide here. There's a, if you just look at the one, the two, the three, the end loop graphs um, you know, for the thermal masses, uh, the daisy graphs, they don't converge. Right. Um, and so that's why you have to do a resummation. But in Linda's paper, what he pointed out um, is that the, and, and he used a different example. He was using um, Yang Mills with massless right. degrees of freedom. And he did the um, thermodynamic potential right. um, that once you go to high enough loop order, um, you just keep getting order one contributions from the next loops. Mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing to do. There's no resummation other than a non fully non-perturbative calculation. Um, it's, not a, it's not a Green's function that you're calculating. It's, a, it's an energy, mm -hmm. right? And so what you're doing the daily resummation, in effect, you're really calculating a part of a Green's function, right? Right, right. And that then, then goes into your, your cur it's, a, it's, a, it's an input into your, um, your calculation of the potential. So you resummed a piece of the input, but not the whole thing. So, so here, I think the problem is that, uh, is that the potential, I don't know what, to, I don't know what I resum. You know, there's no Schwinger Dyson equation that says I'm effectively resumming something. I see. Um, and, and I should also mention, by the way, you mentioned the daisy resummation and the super daisy resummation. This procedure of doing the three dimensional effective field theory um, encodes those resummations. Um, and, and it actually does it, I think, in a much more sort of elegant way um, than we're used to doing, you know, when we learn from Arnold and Espinoza about daisy resummation and all that, and from Weinberg. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would just, as a parenthetical thing, advocate people starting to think about using the 3D EFT uh, for perturbation theory. You can do it in a gauge invariant way. Um, it still has some infrared issues. That's why you see these sort of spiky things here uh, on these blue lines and the red lines. Um, but the potential at least is well behaved. Um, and so, uh, so just a parenthetical comment uh, for pr practitioners to, to, to tr try to do that. I see. Thanks. Are there any additional questions? If not, I think it's time to thank Michael again for this uh, very nice seminar. I remind you that the. Uh, Michael is in a colloquium tomorrow. And again, I hope that you will all be able to attend. Uh, and with no further ado, we thank Michael again. Thank, thank you, Michael. Right. And thanks, thank thanks you everybody. Michael.